Amen. It's good to be back. It's good to see you guys. It's good to see your faces. If you would turn with me to 1 John chapter 2, we'll continue our study there. And as you're turning there, I'm going to read from John chapter 8 to begin our time to set the tone, if you will, for what we're going to be talking about in 1 John chapter 2. It's encouraging to me as I read a different, different commentators talk about um, the letter of 1 John, and, and, and I, I totally agree with them that the gospel of John is almost expected to have been read by the reader of the letter of 1 John. The things that John is talking about in his letter to the churches are, are so closely tied and knit together with the gospel of John, with what Jesus did and how he moved and what he said. And so I believe that as John writes in his letter, he's connecting a lot of things and taking them even further in understanding from the gospel of John into his letter to the churches. And returning to the gospel of John this morning, I just want to read one verse to you from John chapter 8 where Jesus is speaking to the crowds, and he says this to them, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and we know that he says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, he says that you, speaking to those who are following him, the disciples, those who are listening to him and obeying him, he says, you are the light of the world. We're going to talk about how those things connect a little bit this morning because I I think it was really well said by Daniel Aiken when he wrote once, like father, like son, like savior, like saint. Like father, like son, like savior, like saint. As we continue in 1 John, I think this thought is really important for us to grasp. And I want to remember the final verse of what you guys studied last week in 1 John 2, 6, where John wrote, the one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked, like father, like son, like savior, like saint. The ones who truly walk in the light, the ones who truly believe walk in the way that Jesus walked. Their lives emulate him. They look like Jesus. They don't look like other things that we we see in the world. In fact, we don't even want them to look that much like the people that are around us, even though you guys are great. And even though we enjoy fellowship, our goal is not to live lives that look like each other. Our goal is to live a life that looks like Jesus. That's who we want to be like. You don't want to be like me. I think most of you would agree with me. But we want to be like Jesus. That's who we want to emulate. That's who we want to be like. And as our earthly parents, mentors, teachers, disciplers will influence through thought and lifestyle, oftentimes our personalities, ways we process information, or even mannerisms will begin to reflect the company that we keep. The person that we start becoming, the character that we start emulating, it it really will reflect the company that we're keeping, which is why it's always so shocking to you and I when we see a lot of gross stuff come out of us in moments of pressure or stress. And that's why many of us as parents or mentors have agreed with Paul in warning as he reminds the church in in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, not to be deceived about this. He says, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. You guys probably heard your parents say that. How many of your parents said bad company corrupts good morals? Wow, not that many. I guess we're an isolated crew. But you got, oh, there's an extra one. Uh, You know, it's funny, Isaac, your family's up here and they had their hands. I was like, were you not listening? Anyway. But it's true, though. Bad company corrupts good morals. Paul says it's true, and I'd like to say this as well. Indeed, I think if we look at this, the opposite is true. The opposite of that is true as well. If we remain in the company of Jesus, what's going to happen to our morality? What's going to happen to our character? If I'm saturated and I'm soaking in the love and the, the presence and the work of Christ, if I'm sitting with him, who, the one who has heart for me and passion for me as my advocate, the one who sent the Spirit and filled me with that Spirit, the character of Jesus will produce within us and emit out of us light. Light will come out of our lives. Refreshing waters, as Jesus says in John chapter 7, when he says that the great day of the feast, come to me if you're thirsty and I will have torrents of living water flowing out of you. And John says he spoke of the Spirit. Jesus was calling people to himself saying, I will fill you with the Spirit. You will not only never thirst again, but he says a torrent of living water will flow out of you. That's going to influence people around you, by the way. That's going to affect people around you. I don't know how many of you have stood against a torrent or against a steady stream, but it it really doesn't care if you're there. It just keeps flowing. 
Keeping company with Jesus will produce not just good morals, but light that cannot be hidden, fruit that is evident in quality because it's growing from healthy lives. And that's what we want. We want fruit that's growing from healthy lives. We don't want plastic fruit. You know that plastic fruit that our kids had in their little kitchen sets when they were young? Looked pretty good from far off, super colorful. But I, I, I don't want you to actually do this, but if we went downstairs into the kids' ministry area and pulled out some of that plastic fruit and tried to eat it, first of all, who knows how many hands have touched it? But it would be gnarly. It wouldn't be good. It's fake. It, it's not true. It's not real. And that's oftentimes the kind of fruit that we seek to, in our flesh, to make it look like we're producing. That's what wearing a mask in church looks like, is producing plastic fruit. But if we are soaking in the presence of Jesus, if we in sincerity have submitted ourselves to his spirit and we're letting him renovate us throughout our lives, we produce naturally healthy fruit. And the good company of Christ begets health in our lives and it affects those around us. It cannot help but to affect those around us. If we are living our lives in sincerity in Jesus, we are not going to be able to stop that from affecting those who are around us. It naturally will. But only if we remain. The evidence of those who remain is shown in a lifestyle lived like Jesus. Other translations of the Bible in that passage in, in verse 5 of that verse say, abide. And Jesus talks a lot about abiding in him to his disciples in the upper room discourse. The same idea we have here in, in the CSB, which we use, remain, remain, stay in Jesus. Find your place, your dwelling with Christ. To that point, John draws our attention in this text this morning to the evidence that we all must produce as we remain in Christ, and that is love for one another. He's already addressed our love for God. I remember I told you, John will continue to circle around and address these subjects, but he's going to go deeper each time he comes around. So he talks about it, and then when he circles around again, he goes a little bit deeper. It's like a spiral that's going to keep widening as he goes deeper and deeper into the issue. Well, now he says, if you love God, it's going to produce something. If you're walking in the light, if you are obeying what Jesus has commanded, if you're walking in the way that he walked, it will produce, as part of that fruit, love for each other. Sincere and true love, not the world's definition of love, true, godly, agape for one another. So let's look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. I didn't pick 7-11, but that's how it works. Not too many of those around anymore. Slurpees later. Here's what it says. 1 John 2, beginning in verse 7. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old command that you've had from the beginning. The old command is the word you have heard. Yet, I'm writing you a new command which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light but hates his brother or sister is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness walks in the darkness and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Notice previously in verse 5, it was our love for God that concerned John. He talks about our love for God in verse 5. And now in verses 7 through 11, he urgently addresses our love for each other. Because love of God will beget love for one another. And a lot of times this is where we find a break in our relationship with the Lord is in our lack of love for others. It's worth noting as he addresses our love for each other, John calls the church, his readers, beloved. As he's talking about loving one another, he begins this section by saying, dear friends, which in the Greek is agape toi, which is where we get the word agape from. He's calling them his loved, and as he spoke before, children. You are my beloved, he says to the church. I love you guys. And John's going to use this Greek word, agape toi, he's going to use it six times in this letter, referring to the church, referring to believers, saying, I love you guys. You need to understand this. It's just interesting to me that John's going to talk about our love for God and then our love for each other. And in the midst of that, he's like, I love you. Right? 
And not in a weird way. We make this creepy sometimes. You guys, John genuinely loves his brothers and sisters, and he doesn't hesitate to show it. He writes it just in this one letter six times. You know, it may be like, okay, you've told me you love me. I get it. He's like, no, you need to get it, beloved. So don't make this creepy. (laughs) And by saying that, immediately some of you will make it creepy. But can we pray together? We can later, but like, can we pray together actively as a church continually, not just today, but every day, for the Lord to make this a reality within us so that we can sincerely express our love for one another in this church? That we would sincerely express our love for one another and in this way. We want to do it in all ways, but I want to call this out. Let's tell each other that we love each other. Let's say the words. For some of us, that makes us uncomfortable. I used to love telling all the guys in my, in my uh, Bible class at the school that I loved them because it just freaked them out. You know, I love you. <sighs> you know, and they immediately recoiled. Yeah, you're all right. You know, like it's, there's something about it. It's like, no, I'm telling you, I love you. It's okay. We need to normalize telling each other that we love each other because the apostles didn't hold back with the churches. They expressed that sincerely to them. We love you guys. We want what's best for you. We're willing to do what it takes to care for you. Do not assume that the people in this church know that you love them. Don't make assumptions. Make sure they know. Say the words. And people are already making it creepy, but that's okay. Guys, don't assume that the people in this church know that you love them. Tell them you do. Treat them like you do. Express the love of Christ from within your heart outward. Listen, as as one of your pastors in this church, I have to model this. I have to do this. Hold me accountable. (laughs) And don't like come up to me and start singing Rod Stewart songs to me either. Like I won't, (laughs) have I told you lately? No, I'm not gonna say it like that. You guys, for many, this feels personally disarming. It can make us feel vulnerable. For a lot of times, expressing emotion, I'll say especially for us guys, because I know that, that the guys in my group, we've talked about this many times. Sometimes it's hard for us to express emotion. We should. It's good that we're vulnerable. It's good that it disarms us. Do you know why? Because Jesus did it. Jesus wasn't afraid to be disarmed. He wasn't afraid to be vulnerable. In fact, he continued to pour out his love and affection even to the point of death on a cross. And his disciples learned it so well that one of them writes to us, the church, in this letter six times, beloved, don't start singing the song. Right? He continues to say it. They learned it so well, but they learned it from Jesus himself. We should do the same. We should express it as well. They learned it so well because they remained in him and his good company, his good character affected the way they lived their lives. That's why John in so many places here in the letter is connecting back to the gospel of John saying, remember we talked about this earlier in chapter one, he goes, we touched him. We listened to him, we heard him speak, we observed his life. We interacted with the savior. It was personal. So too it should be for us. Notice this, according to the text, this is not a new command either. I like how John says that right at the onset in verse 7. He says, dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old command that you have had from the beginning. The old command is the word you've heard. Well, the word, whenever I see the word, I think of scripture. And it's interesting if you look back even as far to the law. In the book of the law, Leviticus 19, 18, God commands his people, do not take revenge or bear a grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now we know within Leviticus, there's lots of laws that deal with the consequences of breaking the law. Consequences for evil. But in this context, when he says, don't take revenge or bear a grudge, he's saying, if somebody says something bad about you or does something that offends you, let it go. Love each other. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This was God's command from the beginning, and Paul affirms it in Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 5, that it was God's plan to save us through Jesus because of God's love for us. God doesn't say, love your neighbor as yourself, but I don't like you. 
God says, love your neighbor as yourself, and he showed us how much he loved us by sending Jesus. He doesn't ask us to have character that he himself does not already possess. Look at Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. That's a powerful text. We were dead. I don't know if you know this, but you don't find a lot of dead people helping themselves out of a situation. They are dead. And he says, you were dead. And God loved you so much that he made you alive again. Amen? That's the gospel. That's how much God's love was shown through Jesus to us. In church, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And you're like, how are we supposed to love? God says, I love you this much. Follow my lead. Follow how I do it. Do it the way that I do it. This is the good role model. This is the type of role model that your parents are like, yes, I want you to hang out with that person because they are a good influence on you. Let God rub off on you in this way that you love in the way he loves. So this isn't a new commandment. It's in the Old Testament. It was God's plan from the beginning. And yet, yet, John says in verse 8, there's a new reality to it. So you're like, so which is it? He says it's, it's not new, it's old. But then he says, but it's new. Is it either? No, it's both. It's both of these things. Because the depth that John takes us to doesn't negate the love of God in the Old Testament. It gives us a whole new depth to it. A whole new revelation of just how far down this goes. He says in verse 8, Yet I'm writing you a new command, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Jesus has already come. You've seen the love of God in human flesh now. You've seen what it looks like. Because of Jesus, this command of God is given a new and true reality because he says that this is true in him and it's new. He doesn't do away with the old commandment. He takes it into a fathomless depth. He gets down in the water and says, we haven't gone all the way, but do you see that? I was on a river last week floating around. People told me it was 150 feet deep. That's creepy. You ever been over like bottomless water where like you're, you know you could swim down as far as you can go and you're not going to find the bottom? And this was in a river. And they're like, yeah, that's like an old like hole down there where there's a spring and it's like 150 feet deep. And another person's like, I heard it was 300. I was like, either way, 150 is enough. You know, I'm not going to tuck tail and go down there and see what's in there, you know, but like you know, <laughs> I'm not going down there. But you guys think about this. God takes us into the the waters of his love. He takes us out into this this, this sea, and he says, try and go down and find the bottom. You're like, nah, I'm good. He's like, you should really go down a little ways, because the farther down you go, the more you realize how deep it goes. The more you realize that you you aren't getting close to the depth. He says, that's how much I love you. And Christian, that's how much you should love each other. It's not just surface anymore. We are aiming for great depth. He takes it to fathomless. Jesus says it best himself. John 13, 34 through 35. I give you a new command. This is why John says it's it's old, but it's new. Why? Because Jesus told him, I give you a new command. John was right there when Jesus said this. Love one another. How? Just as I have loved you. I don't think they said it that way. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. At the old, in in Leviticus 19, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. That feels a lot more doable on our own strength, doesn't it? How about love each other the way Jesus loves you? Yeah, I'm tapping out. I don't have the ability to do that. Does that mean I quit? No, I need help. You know, it's like me at Home Depot. Excuse me. I need help. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, he says, if you love one another. Not only do we have to trust him to do this, but if we don't, we won't be identified properly. We won't be identified the way we should because he says, this is how everyone's going to know you're my disciples. Because you love each other the way that I love you. Isn't that a startling thing when you see it? Isn't that a rattling thing when you see people loving each other the way Jesus loves them? What moves us 
when we see a story that involves someone laying down their life for somebody else, what about that is moving us? What about that like stirs us up like, wow, that's incredible. This person literally died for that person, took their place. What about that is so powerful? You're seeing a picture of Jesus. You're seeing somebody live out in reality something that Jesus himself did. And it's inspirational. And it's the way we should lay down our lives for each other. And by the way, if we look at it in the the ultra picture of laying down our lives, that means in every other way that is easier, we ought to serve one another and love one another in those ways. It's funny how some people think that they would jump out in front of a car for somebody but not wash the dishes for them. Right? Bring it into the practical. Bring it into the now. What are you willing to do for someone just because you love them on a very day-to-day, what may seem mundane basis? This is the way we ought to love one another, that we live our lives looking for opportunities. We live our lives looking for opportunities to love each other. Love your neighbor as yourself sounds nothing like just as I have loved you you are also to love one another. It doesn't negate love your neighbor as yourself. It gives you depth. It gives you a fathomless depth. Love is not new. It can said as well as as timeless as God and rooted in his law, yet it's new to us in conversion and new in its depth in Jesus. It's new in experience, emphasis, expression, and endurance. It is old as the sun and new as the dawn. I wish I could write like that. Love to take credit, but I can't. Love is as old as the sun, new as the dawn. I think of his mercies that are new every morning. Those mercies stem out of the love of God for me. Stems out of the love of God for you. When he sees you, when you wake up in the morning, he says, my love for you is just as strong as it was yesterday. John continues in verse 9, he says, because of this, he says, the command I'm giving you, it's old, yet it's new, it's both of of those things, it's the word that Christ spoke to us, he says, so here's the the point, verse 9, the one who says he's in the light but hates his brother or sister is in the darkness until now. If you hate people, you're living in the darkness, you're not walking in the light. The one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light, there's no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Notice Jesus leaves no middle ground here. You love him or you hate him. A lot of times you're like, well, I'm not overly fond of that person. Do you love him or do you hate him? You're like, well, that's such a strong word. They're such strong words. I didn't make them up. It's just in the text. I, I, don't, I don't get to make those decisions. He doesn't leave us room to wiggle around this. There's no transitory stage. And it makes this passage easy to understand and yet so difficult for us in our flesh to make reality. To live out in reality. Knowing that God says, you got to love people because that's my heart for them. You can't hate them. And there is no in between. Because of our sin nature, we struggle with this. We get in our own way and we battle against that fleshly nature when it comes to remaining in the light and loving others the way that Jesus loves them. John first addresses deception by using another sentence that begins with the one who says. Did you notice that? If you look at it in the text, he says in verse 9, the one who says he's in the light but hates his brother or sister is in the darkness until now. Self-deception I don't know if you guys have noticed this, if we've, as we've been going through 1 John, self-deception has been on display multiple times. In fact, up to this point in verse 9, it's been on display five times. And it's fascinating to me to look at these, and I actually want to read these, and we'll put them on the screen for you. But five times from the beginning of the letter until now, here in verse 9, we've been warned against deceiving ourselves. Chapter 1, verse 6, he says, If we say we have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in darkness, we're lying and not practicing the truth. Chapter 1, verse 8, If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Chapter 1, verse 10, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Chapter 2, verse 4, The one who says I've come to know him, and yet doesn't keep his commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 
And then here in verse 9, the one who says he is in the light but hates his brother or sister is in the darkness until now. Why is it John saying, beloved, my dear children, church whom I love, be very, very aware of self-deception. Be very aware that you could be deceiving yourself even right now. John's writing in such a way that we would not only be encouraged in how we ought to live and obey and love, but also that we would be warned that we have a tendency in our flesh to deceive ourselves, to think that we maybe are doing a little bit better than we actually are, maybe have a little bit better perception or understanding, or that we're actually caring about someone when we're not. It's call for examination. And he says this in chapter 2, verse 1. We read this a couple weeks ago. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. He says, I'm writing this so that you avoid sin, so that you don't fall into sin. I talked about this with my kids this last week as we were talking about people in the past that I've known who have said, you know, I'm kind of a person that has to experience things because I was talking to them about a sin that they were, they were struggling with. And like, you know, I, I, I see that people say this doesn't work out, but I kind of got to figure that out for myself. And I said, then why over and over in Scripture, not only through historical narrative, but through teaching and commands, God says, don't do this. I'm trying to teach you not to sin. They're like, well, I really need to sin to find out if sin is truly sinful. I really want to see if this is going to hurt me. That's crazy. It's lunacy. Why would you do something when the ultimate power in the universe looks at you and says, don't, this hurts. Stop. Now, it's not that we won't struggle with the temptation, but excusing ourselves and saying, like, I have to experience it for myself. The body of Scripture teaches us, don't. There is warning here. There is a directive. There is encouragement not to look at what happened to this person. You know, so many people get, get confused when they read the Old Testament. They're like, yeah, look at, I mean, at King David, a man after, you know, God's own heart. Yet he did all these things. It's like, yeah, those aren't being prescribed for you. They're being described because they really happened. And did you not read the parts where that hurt him greatly and destroyed his life? Think about the sins that David just himself committed and how it affected his life from that point forward. That's all there for our warning so that we wouldn't replicate it. And John says, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. I don't think any of us would contend that John doesn't love the church. If he didn't love them, he wouldn't write to them. He also wouldn't be going through all the things that he goes through for them. Living his life in the way as his life speaks and screams of his love for the church. I don't think any of us would contend that he loves them. We would all agree that he does if we read his words. But he appeals to them and speaks to them as a loving father in the faith and calls them his beloved and seeks for their strength in relationship with the Lord. His love for them is not just an exhortation. His love for them is in warning and in correction through discipline as well. We cannot miss that. We know Proverbs 3, 11 through 12, I think most of us. I want to read it by way of reminder where Solomon wrote, do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son, and do not loathe his discipline. Quite possibly, this is David speaking to Solomon and him recount, re, re, like, um, recording that. Verse 12, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves, just as a father disciplines the son in whom he delights. The discipline of God is not for our destruction, it's for our encouragement in right behavior and right living. It's to prevent pain and suffering. It's to teach us the lessons that we need to learn. Don't despise the Lord's instruction. And we shouldn't despise the instruction of Scripture ever. The correction that Scripture brings. Loving someone does not mean agreeing with them all the time. Loving someone does not mean that we avoid conflict. Sometimes conflict is the most loving thing that we can do. If I don't care about my kids, I'm not going to address the wrong in their lives. I'm going to let them grow up thinking the wrong things, and they can go out and do whatever they want, and I don't care. That's being unloving. That's hating my children. Because I'm not willing to go into a place of difficulty and have the hard conversations. But loving parents dip into that difficulty. They dip into that conflict because conflict is a necessary part of life. And John is showing us this. He's saying, if you're saying this, you're deceiving yourselves. Stop. I'm telling you these things so you don't sin. 
I'm teaching you these things so you don't fall deeper into that hole. Loving someone doesn't mean agreeing with them. It's caring enough to have a relationship with them so that when they need encouragement, we provide it. When they need correction, we can speak it lovingly and vice versa. That means we have to open ourselves up to other people speaking into our lives as well. I'm not only going to willingly go into conflict to restore my brothers and sisters, but I'm willing to open myself up when they come to me and I receive what they have to say. I take it to scripture. And if it's true, I need to apologize. I need to receive that rebuke. I need to accept it. To hate someone is to reject God's view of them as a human being and to treat them as he is not. Did you notice that? Hating someone is rejecting God's view of them as a human being. That means when we see people who are caught up in a fault, as Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians 6, 1, you who are spiritual should restore them in a spirit of gentleness. He says, keep watch on yourselves that you don't get tempted in the sin that they're in. But he says, if any of you gets caught in a fault, bring them home. Don't leave them out there. He says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And most would agree, the law of Christ that he's referring to is love each other the way that Jesus loves you. If you love people the way Jesus loves them, you are going to go after them and restore them back. You're going to show them what's going on. You're going to have the hard conversations. Church, we have to be people who do and speak difficult things for the glory of God. We have to pursue one another. We have to love each other enough not to hate each other through inaction. We can hate people by speaking or by failing to speak. We can hate people through actions or through inaction. It is situational as we look at it. There isn't a a, a template that we can apply to this and say, This is how I'm going to handle every situation. No, God has given us his word and he's given us his spirit to know how to walk through restoring people back. But you guys, the one who says he's in the light but hates his brother or sister is in the darkness themselves, he says, until now. God corrects as a good father and he always offers a pathway of restoration. He corrects and he points out what's wrong and says, here's how we get you back. We have to reflect him in that. Verse 10 says, The one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light. There's no cause for stumbling in him. Notice that's stumbling for the person who's remaining in the light. He says, if you're in the light, and the metaphor is clear, isn't it? I think the metaphor is is really, really clear. In the light, we can see our footing. That's why I always turn the lights on when I go into my kids' rooms. You know, I need to know what's on the floor. I've learned my lesson. But that's just common sense. I need to know where what's there. I need to be able to see what's in front of me. I need to see my footing. But when I'm walking in the darkness, it's a mess. It's dangerous. I'm using my kids' rooms metaphor. It's a very dangerous thing. You guys, there's no cause for stumbling in us when we're remaining in Christ, walking just as Jesus walked. If you want to live confidently, Remain in the light. If you want to be strong, if you want to be at peace, if you want to not have everything your way, not have all the situations in your life just be perfect, if you want to have peace in the storm, if you want to be like Jesus sleeping in the storm, in in the boat, and the disciples are like, oh, we don't know what to do. And Jesus is out. Why? He's a peaceful man. He's not worried about it. He's like, why are you guys freaking out? Calm down, Storm. Need to talk to the boys real quick, right? Think about it. Jesus is at peace in the midst of it because he's with the Father. He's doing the Father's will. He knows where he is. If I know that what I'm doing is what God has called me to do and I'm walking in the light, I have peace. I can have peace there. And a lot of times we're struggling with that peace because we're wrestling with walking back into the dark again. Or maybe we're in it again already. And there in the dark, and this is the reference to hating brother or sister. He's making this a very, a very strong point. 
It applies to many areas of our life, but the, the, the point that John's making with this is that we will know whether we're in the light or not because of how we're treating each other, how we're loving each other, or if we're hating them. He says, and the one who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness, walks in darkness, doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, for us sitting in a well-lit room, this doesn't sound that threatening. Have you ever been in woods that you are unfamiliar with in complete darkness with no moon in the middle of the night? Very scary stuff. He says the person that's there can't see where they're going, doesn't know the terrain, doesn't have any guiding instruments. You're lost. That's the person who hates his brother or sister. The question we have to ask ourselves, church, is are we struggling or in a place? And I, I shouldn't even use struggling. Are we hating each other in any way? Not struggling. You either are or you're not. Are you hating each other by mistreating one another through words or actions? I'm not asking that to make you feel like your pastor's beating you down. I'm asking myself. I'm asking because we are all loving family members. And church, we need to keep this in mind. Are we hating each other by ignoring one another? Should we be ignoring people and be hating them through that action? Not because, you know, you forgot to call somebody. You're like, oh, forgot. I'm sorry. It's not that. It's like I'm avoiding this person because I don't want to deal with them. Don't hate your brother or sister. Are we hating each other by refusing to humble ourselves and care more about what each other needs rather than what we want? Could my hobby cause me to hate you? Absolutely. Could my passion for things of this world, which are inanimate, cause me to hate you? Amoral things that you look at and you say, this could be used for good, this could be used for bad. Is my love for that thing or my attention to that thing, could it cause me to be a hateful brother or sister? Hateful to a brother's sisters. I, that's not optional. I'm a brother. But if it, do you understand what I'm saying? What is it in my life that I could actually be paying more attention to or loving more than my brothers or sisters in Christ? Is there something that I value more? There's nothing wrong with having hobby. There's nothing wrong with having passion. But if they replace the love of God flowing from us into other people, we have a problem that we have to address. I have a problem if I let the things that I want to do get in the way of what I need to do for the church, for my family. On behalf of the Lord as his representative, when I let those things get in the way, I ought to be rebuked. And I'm so thankful that I have Pastors that stand alongside me and have the freedom to look at me and say, you're out of balance. Get your life right. They have the freedom to look at me and tell me when I'm wrong. And I need that. Because every single one of us struggles with that balance. Every single one of us struggles with hating one another, not even like directly like walking and go, I really hate you. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you'd ever say that to their face, but you might be doing it with your action or inaction. You might be doing it through your hobby. Are we willing as a church to bring these things to the Lord that are very attached to us and do exactly what Paul says in Romans chapter 12 where he says, I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices. Present yourselves to God as a sacrifice. Give it all to the Lord, every bit of it. Everything that you do, everything that you're passionate about, all the people that are in your life, give them to God. Give them the priority that God gives to them. We have to face these questions together, church, and it's not because God's mad at us. It's not because I'm mad at you or anyone in this church that serves you is mad at you. It's because we love each other enough to say, beloved, we must be doers of the word and not hearers only. Notice that James pulls at the same thread as John. He says, deceiving yourselves. Don't be hearers only, but be doers of the word. Church, beloved, John's going to say this in chapter 4, let us love one another. 
For love is from God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. Let us love one another. Let us care for one another. Let us express it in appropriate ways to each other. Let us speak it and show it through our actions. I have to say, you guys, I'm so proud of you. I really am. And I want to make sure at this juncture, at the end of this message, to tell you how much I see the love of God in you. How much I see you guys care for each other. How much I see you guys mentor and encourage one another. I met with a few pastors this last week. And as we talked, they were talking about how frustrating it is that so many in their people in their church, don't serve and care for each other in practical ways. And I, I didn't really say much because I felt really blessed in that moment to think of our church, and I, I really feel like the majority of this church is serving, loving, and caring for each other in some way. But you guys find ways to do it, and I want you to know I see it. God sees it, and I'm really proud of you guys. It's awesome to watch. And I want to encourage you guys as we sit out in the river over this really deep water that there's no end to how deep we can go in that. There's no end to how deep we can go in caring for one another and that this is how the world is going to know that we love God. This is how the world is going to know that we belong to him when they see us going to fathomless depth in care for each other and in loving for each other. It's going to look a little bit different than what many of the church backgrounds that we've grown up in looks like. Good. Good. Let's take it down there. Let's go deep. Let's care for each other. Let's ask the Lord to do this in us. Worship team, would you guys come up? Lord, as we desire to go to that fathomless depth, As we long to go to this place of knowing you, loving you, Lord, and having your love at work in our lives. God, I just admit that this is something that you have brought conviction in my life for so many times. Lord, that I have caught myself thinking that I was loving people through an action and Lord I was actually hating them and so Jesus would you change our hearts would you renovate us again would you deal with the issues within us Lord because you love us because we love each other Lord we want to see that flow this isn't condemnation your word tells us there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus we are no longer slaves to sin we are slaves to righteousness and so Lord Bring that change, bring that fresh wind through prayer, through submission, through worship. God, worship in the, t- in the context of singing to you, seeking your face, Lord, studying your word, serving one another in the practical ways, sitting and crying with each other when someone's mourning or, or laughing and rejoicing with them when you've done something good. God, I, I pray that we would be molded into your image. Jesus, we want to be like you. And so would you, in this time, stir our hearts, draw us close, reveal things, Lord, your your light that shines into our lives reveals, and that's a good thing. It's a safe place to be in when you are revealing sin because you care enough to cleanse us. When we confess, as we already read in this letter, we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Would you do that work now, fresh, for this church? As we worship you, Lord, stir us.